Hello, everyone. This is Brad Thomas, and welcome back to the Ground Up CEO podcast series. And today uh, we're joined actually on the farm with the CEO of Farmland, Paul Pittman. Farm is liter- uh, Paul is literally uh, working today on the job. He's got his hat on and looks like he's, uh, he's somewhere, somewhere in a farm. So, Paul, where are you today? I'm actually in central Illinois uh, on a farm that I personally own. It's where I grew up. Uh, and I just happened to be here today. And so I found a reasonably quiet office, uh, but I am dressed like a farmer uh, to, <laughs> this, uh, to do this call. Great. Well, uh, Paul, we will uh, we'll, we'll, uh, skip the bios. We've interviewed you so many times uh, so we can go back to some of those previous uh, interviews to talk about your, your bio, which is, obviously includes more than farming. Paul is a, uh, has a Harvard uh, degree hanging on his wall somewhere in his real office. But uh, Paul, uh, let's start with some, some more recent news. Now, I just noted that uh, you just announced recently this uh, acquisition of Murray Wise Associates. And I think Murray Wise is an individual. I did a little research on him. Uh, he is uh, claimed to be the, the, the father of farmland investing. So uh, what's this all about? Yeah. So just a little bit on Murray Wise's background. So, so first, Farmland Partners, the public vehicle that I'm the CEO of, we did acquire Murray Wise and Associates. And Murray Wise, he really is the father of sort of institutional farmland investing. He literally wrote the book on the topic back in the 1980s and 1990s. He built up Westchester Company. Westchester is now a division of Nuveen. Uh, It's the largest uh, uh, institutional investor in farmland today in the United States and probably in the world. Uh, He sold that business back in 2010. It was already the largest vehicle at the time. Uh, and then went, you know, stayed sort of on his own. Um, the reason we have done this transaction is, first, we we are going to together uh, raise private capital to invest in the farmland asset class alongside the public capital that we have, probably in a joint venture type structure. Uh, the second thing is, you know, Murray Wise has at this point, uh, you know, 50 years worth of history of investing in the asset class. I have about 30 years. Uh, together, we really think that it's sort of the leading intellectual team in terms of thinking about the asset class, thinking about the long-term nature of it, the return, the risk management, and the appreciation side. The, the other thing, though, that we really get from the transaction is to present to the potential investor a sort of one-stop shop to be able to invest in the farmland asset class. And what I mean by that is if, you know, you come into the, into the Farmland Partners Murray Wise office and say, I want to buy a farm. Well, here's a real estate broker. We'll help you buy a farm. I already own a farm. I want it managed. Well, we have a farm management division. Um, I want to, uh, I, I want to, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a long-term investor. I don't need liquidity. I'd like to invest in a private vehicle, not have the daily mark to market that comes with a public stock. Uh, and so I'm happy to, to, to make an investment in a private vehicle. Well, we have a private vehicle as well. And then finally, uh, no, what I really want is daily liquidity and the ease and simplicity and transparency of a public company. Then there, here we have the public company uh, that we run called you know, FPI. And so we really think we have sort of instantly created kind of the leading clearinghouse for somebody that wants to invest in farmland as an asset class. Great. Now, I definitely see the value, and I know analysts don't like to talk about brand equity, but I, I do, and I do think that this could uh, certainly enhance the brand equity of FPI Farmland, the public company. I guess the only concern I have, again, th- putting my analyst hat on, Paul, is conflicts of interest. So, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how, you know, obviously that's uh, you've got a, if you have a pro- public and a private vehicle, you know, how are, how are you gonna, going to uh, prevent these conflicts? Yeah, look, the conflict of interest question is one we thought about. It's really always the most important question in these sorts of transactions. The first thing is this market is so large and it is so early in the development of institutional investing into the asset class that there isn't really that very much of that theoretical situation where there's only one really good farm and you're competing with it, both with the public vehicle and the private vehicle, and only one of you is going to win. That, to, to a great degree, just doesn't exist. There's $2.5 trillion of farmland in the United States. Um, there's an immense amount of deal volume in any given year. 
So there's really not this competition. But but taking it a, a step farther, you know, the, the REIT, we are running this uh, relationship with private capital through the REIT. Any fee income, any sort of earnings that come from managing that capital will flow into the REIT. Um, Furthermore, we're structured in such a way that the REIT can, if it chooses to, co-invest with the private vehicle. So to the extent there is that competition on it for a given asset, the REIT can always take a, something in the neighborhood of 10% or, or greater share in that investment, sometimes as much as maybe even 30%, depending on, on whether there's a, a meeting of the minds about sort of the long-term uh, intent uh, of those investments. Great. Well, let's, I want to kind of move back, I guess, a couple days uh, prior to this announcement we have with Murray. Um, looks like you're staying pretty active. There was a, a new acquisition for FPI, 815 acres in Missouri. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, we, we bought a farm in what's called the Missouri Boot Heel. That's the far southeastern part of Missouri. Missouri is an unusual state in sort of a farmland sense. The northern probably half or more of the state is really the Midwest terms of culturally and in, in the sense of how the agriculture industry works. The southern part of the state, particularly the southeast corner, um, is really part of the Delta, the Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi region, a lot of rice growing. So this is a Delta uh, region farm. Um, it is in the southeast corner in the boot heel, has the ability to grow uh, corn, soybeans, rice, cotton. Uh, we're pretty happy with that investment. Um, it's a very, very strong agricultural area. It's our first investment in Missouri. Uh, so it, it's a new state that we're, we're thrilled to have entered and will continue um, to invest in, in Missouri going, going forward. Great. Well, before we dive into earnings, and I want to touch on that before we get done here, but I would like to get just a brief update. Uh, I know, uh, you know, we've been covering there's the lawsuit that uh, was, uh, um, I guess, triggered by a Seeking Alpha article. Um, and so is that still in progress? Uh, kind of what's what's the up, latest update in, in that particular lawsuit? Yes. Um, you know, we, we really have sort of two different pieces of litigation that were spawned from that uh, uh, from the short and distort attack on the company in 2018. Uh, the first is our effort to sort of bring to justice the people who attacked the company. And they didn't just attack the company in sort of an intellectual sense. If that's all they had done, we wouldn't even be talking about it today. What they did was they did a manipulative market set of market trades and then put out an article that essentially said we were insolvent, corrupt, bad actors in many different ways, none of which is true. But the way that Delta hedging works with those short positions, it is really the match that set off the explosion. So once that article was out there, caused our stock to go down just a little bit, the person who had written those put options is forced to cover themselves. And the way they cover themselves is of course short our stock. And it led to a 40% decline in the stock price. Now the key, you know, one of the key perpetrators of that, the person who actually you know, wrote the article and posted it on Seeking Alpha, came out in uh, late June or July of this year, I forget exactly when, and admitted that they made it up, that they were paid to write it by a hedge fund, um, and that the position they took in that article is largely, if not entirely, unsupported by the facts. Since that time, Seeking Alpha has barred that person from po posting any more information. His name is Quentin Matthews, went by Rota Fortune. It's just an absolute scam. Um, and this guy has really admitted it. So he's off to the side, paid us a bunch of damages, admitted his wrongdoing. Um, we're still pursuing the hedge fund. The second part of this case, though, which is, as I often say, is even more frustrating than the part I just described. We were sued by uh, some class action lawyers con you know, working on contingency uh, on, quote unquote, on behalf of the shareholders, even after the recantation of Rota Fortune, they are continuing these lawsuits against the company. They are outrageous. They're baseless. It's incredibly expensive to defend them. Um, and, you know, we're stuck doing it. And we are every day, unfortunately, spending shareholder money, um, you know, second largest shareholder in the company. So it's certainly a significant chunk of my money defending ourselves 
and you can't get rid of it. It's, it's the most unjust and unfair thing I've ever been involved with in my life to have to defend ourselves in a, in a class action lawsuit based on a fraudulent short and distort attack. I mean, the way I describe it is the first group of people, Rota Fortune and the hedge fund, they mugged us. And now that we're laying on the street after having been mugged, the class action people are coming up and stealing our wallet. That's that's what this is. That's the analogy that I can make. And it's very frustrating. We will win them. They will eventually end. Um, but we do have to continue that fight, unfortunately. And it you know suppresses our current AFFO and returns uh, because of the cost. Well, thank you for that update, Paul. And again, you know, we've uh, we've been covering the company since really you went you went public um, and watched this, uh, you know, this lawsuit. And now we're seeing this recovery. I mean, not only through COVID, but just a lot of the initials, obviously, we're fundamental uh, investors. So uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of really strong growth opportunities ahead for the company. And we think there's substantial improvement uh, for price appreciation, given the fundamental outlook of the company. So can you talk a little bit about third quarter results just at a high level and then uh, kind of what you're seeing uh, for the remainder of the year? Yeah. So, so, you know, first, when you think about farmland, it's really a total return asset class. So it's a combination of the current yield and the long-term appreciation. So the history, and when I say history, 70, 80 years worth of data would say that farmland will return on a unlevered basis, total return of around 10 to 11 percent. You know, that, by the way, is better than the S&P 500. So that's a really good return number. Um, and that will come to you partly with current yield and partly with appreciation. So just turning to the appreciation side, we are right now, because farmland is such a hedge against inflation, in an incredibly powerful cycle. Farmland in the core of the United States, according to the Fed and other data sources, probably up 20 percent in the last year, maybe more. Um, you know, Illinois itself, we own almost uh, 35, 40,000 acres in the state of Illinois. It's our biggest uh, invest state in terms of investment. You know, that farm that that farmland is up uh, 20, 25, 30 percent in the last uh, in the last year or so. Those are really out, you know, outstanding improvements in the value, which I do not think are embedded uh, in our current stock price. Uh, the market just isn't uh, seeing that and grasping it as, as rapidly as they should, even though there's public data supporting that kind of appreciation. Turning to earnings itself, as I, as I alluded to a minute ago, you know, the, our earnings are actually being, you know, they're climbing pretty well, but for these big legal costs. That's what you would expect in a strong mark, mark economy. Now, our earnings are unfortunately difficult to understand except in the full 12 month cycle because farming and farmland rental is an annual business. An incredible amount of our, our total revenue comes in in the fourth quarter of the year. Um, and, and, you know, so the first three quarters of the year always seem, you know, almost weird when you look at our financial statements um, because what we've, in many times we've already collected the rent, but we're forced to, put it straight line through our P&L. Um, and we also have quite a bit of expenses. And then in the fourth quarter, we have this incredibly large additional revenue that comes in, um, you know, for, for the year because of all the crop share or bonus rents that we receive on our land all come in in that fourth quarter. So I think, you know, we're, uh, we're feeling like we're sort of on pace for a pretty strong year, a year that's certainly better than last year or the year before. Um, Again, but for this litigation overhang, uh, we're having a, a great the operating business is, is actually pretty strong. The other thing we did recently, which which I think you and I talked about in a, in a prior podcast or, or at least I know we've talked about, uh, we recently converted a preferred security and that changes the cash flow of the company by around um, $6.2 million, $6.3 million a year. It'll improvement to AFFO, you know, bringing that down to a per share basis, that's something in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 cents per share of improved AFFO. So these things haven't really shown up in the financials, even though they're, they're, they're known in a theoretical sense by the market, it's public information. But the very first time you'll see that positive impact in the PL is the annual 
uh, financial that we do, you know, sometime roughly early February. Great. And in terms of your your capital, you, you mentioned this preferred swap out. Uh, I know the lawsuit's been, you know, somewhat of an overhang and a drag on earnings. But uh, how is your how is your capital right now? And I guess also I was going to ask if you've been able to utilize any of the OP units for your uh, acquisitions. Um, so first on the OP units, we haven't used OP units uh, on any acquisitions recently. Um, you know, one of the reasons we haven't is after that lawsuit, the people that got hurt the worst, frankly, were the OP unit holders. Uh, we feel very bad about that, that there's, a, you know, small farmers who had taken our OP units. And in fact, when that, you know, fraud on the market was committed by the short and distort crowd, those people aren't in a position to even protect themselves. They don't have liquid securities, but they essentially suffer the same downdraft that everybody else has, but no liquidity because you can't just sell your OP unit. Um, so we so we just really have not used OP units in uh, um, transactions recently. We will start to do so again, um, but I think it'll be in a form where people are protected from that sort of risk, probably as some sort of preferred operating partnership unit uh, for acquisitions. The um, I forgot the second part of your question. Uh, uh, what was it again, Brad? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Just overall, the kind of how are you from a liquidity perspective and a capital perspective. How are you set up for additional yeah, acquisitions? Yeah, um, we have some level of borrowing capacity available in the, available in the company because we have quite a few assets where we own them but have not levered them at all. Uh, but we are, you know, as we've stated to the market, we're generally speaking trying to delever the company a little bit because we think that's better, uh, a better position to be in. That being said, that that borrowing capacity, if we found the great deal, we could use that borrowing capacity to go and get that deal done. Um, we also have uh, quite a bit of cash on the balance sheet currently. So we have a decent pipeline that we'll be closing here in the next month or so. And then, you know, eventually we'll we'll go on to raise uh, additional capital, but probably in the form of our ATM, frankly. That's the most efficient way to raise equity capital that we can. Uh, you know, depending on market conditions, we could do a, a bigger offer. But as as you uh, you know, as your audience well understands, the ATM is a far far more efficient way for a REIT to raise capital than than traditional offerings. Right. And last question, Paul. And I know you know it's important for a lot of retail investors. Of course, is a dividend. Uh, I know looking back, you know, um, your company was forced to cut the dividend. Uh, I believe initially because of the lawsuit, kind of an abundance of caution there, pay attorneys. Uh, right now, the dividend is still about uh, five cents per share, a nickel per share, 20 cents uh, annualized. Um, how do you look at your dividend policy? And I guess I wanna also just state for the record, and I'm, this is not at all guidance whatsoever, but I will point out to the uh, audience here that we've got uh, analyst projections of about 29 cents in AFFO in 22 and, and, and 44 cents for 23, which, which is a significant step up uh, from 21 to 22, essentially negative in 21. And then another big uh, pop in 23. Again, these are very limited analysts. Uh, we only got five and only maybe one or two that are going out to 23. But but with that in mind, how do you how would you dis describe your dividend policy? Well, we yeah we did cut our dividend right after the short and distorted attack. We did it to preserve capital as a terrifying experience, frankly, for the company. I mean, we survived through it, um, so we made a, a major reduction in dividend. Uh, now that we have done that, our dividend policy is that we we want to give investors some uh, current yield against uh, from those assets really you know largely we receive rents and we want to we, we we run with a very low overhead uh, in the company we're a very efficient manager there's only about 15 and 15 employees in FPI and now with the Murray wise acquisition you know we might be up up to the low 20s 25 at the most so we we really do want to distribute some current earnings but we think that that our investor base, it should be largely long-term focused investors, total return style investors. If you, you know, what we encourage people to do is if they want to create liquidity to frankly sell some of, of their shares, we're not likely to make aggressive dividend increases. Although I think there will need to be some level of increases over time because of the 
the facts you just uh, just put out there that we're going to see a pretty significant increase in the cash flows of the company and we'll be almost forced to have some level of dividend increase to stay in compliance with the REIT law and the REIT rules. So, but our, but our position really is um, to, to keep maintain, uh, frankly, a relatively modest dividend um, under the theory that it lets us control, grow the company more rapidly, reinvest in the assets that we own. These assets are appreciating quite rapidly. Uh, reduce debt, all the other things that create long-term value for shareholders. And it, you know, you know all the arguments that dividends in and of itself are sometimes a very efficient, inefficient way of getting cash capital out and cash flow out. That that obviously is disappointing to people that want to invest in the asset class purely as a or mainly as a uh, a current yield sort of play. But I think in our philosophy on balance, we'd rather be the, be sort of a total return focused uh, asset. Great. Well, uh, Paul, I, I'm going to close out. I think you, uh, you could appreciate this quote from, uh, uh, and, and as, as one of the largest shareholders of farmland, you can appreciate the fact that what uh, John D. Rockefeller said, do you know the only thing that gives me pleasure it's to see my dividends coming in. And since you're a shareholder, obviously you like getting dividends too. I want to remind the audience that you are aligned with with us. Um, Paul, I want to thank you for your time. This reminds me of uh, when I was young, I used to, of course, I'm a rapper too. A lot of people don't realize uh, I wrote the rap review when I was in high school, but I remember this, calling all the cows down to the farm, calling all the cows down to the barn. We'll have a little milk and we'll have a little cream. We'll have a little butter, a little margarine. And so uh, since you're on the farm, I thought it was appropriate for to end with, with that little uh, piece of uh, a poetry, we'll call it. And Paul, it's good to see you today. Yeah, it's really, really good to see you with you. And when you all sit down next week to your Thanksgiving dinner, thank an American farmer. You got it. Thanks again, Paul. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.